Hey there, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil, and tonight I want to talk about what just might be the most profitable cryptocurrency in the United States. No, it's not Bitcoin, it's not Ethereum, Dogecoin, Ripple, Dash, Monero, Verge, Neo, Zcash, Laserjuice, Zapcandy, or Jimmy Bits. It's a cryptocurrency that many of us, myself included, have been unknowingly invested in and which is paying some of us amazing returns. In terms of content warnings, tonight I'll be briefly mentioning topics like colonialism, ableism, homelessness, and murder. No graphic details, but just be forewarned, this is not a cheerful video. With that said, let's get into it. The word cryptocurrency is made up of two parts, crypto and currency. Crypto comes from the Greek word for secret or hidden. It's where we get the word cryptography, the science of creating and deciphering secret languages, as well as the word crypt, meaning a hidden vault, a buried tomb secreted away from prying eyes. Currency is another term for money, but it comes from the Latin word currere, meaning to run, the same root used for the concept of an ocean current. In a literal sense, currency refers to something running or flowing from person to person. The modern use of the term cryptocurrency makes reference to the fact that, generally, the money itself is invisible, disconnected from physical assets, and managed by complex cryptography. It can also be a reference to the fact that, generally, the people trading the money are themselves hidden in some sense. They aren't on file with a bank, the transactions aren't recorded on a personal credit report, and purchases are made, if not anonymously, at least pseudonymously, such that the people buying boner pills and heroin on the dark web probably won't be outed and arrested because of the transaction. Tonight, I'm going to be using the term in a different sense. I'm going to be taking a more literal approach and defining cryptocurrency as something hidden flowing between people as a medium of exchange a unit of account, a store of value. This is because I believe that the unit of value the United States is fascinated with and fueled by is not the dollar, is not Bitcoin, is not corn futures. It's something much older. I believe the United States runs on an economy of suffering. Does that sound a little over the top, a little dramatic? Okay, let me hit you with this. The entire housing market runs on the fact that some people can buy up multiple instances of a product that all of us need to live. Shelter. Without shelter, we suffer and die, right? But someone wealthy who already has shelter can buy 10, 20, 100 extra shelters and rent them back out to your family and friends at a markup and make some profit. Except, the only thing that makes that profit possible is the fear of homelessness and the threat of eviction. If they can't kick your family out on the street when you can't afford the inflated rent, they don't really own that asset, do they? Couple that with a fact I've mentioned in other videos. There are, by conservative estimates, 31 empty houses for every homeless person in the United States. The wealthy are hoarding empty houses and preventing unhoused people from seeking shelter. Not because they're using the property to protect life or human dignity, but because for them, housing is a casino chip to play with. Win some, lose some. It's a game. For you, life or death. For them, roulette. Is it or is it not suffering to lack shelter? Is it or is it not suffering to live in a car with your kids because you can't afford housing? And have you seen how the unhoused are treated? They bring rifles to kick you out of your tent. They're getting rid of benches so you can't rest your body. They got rid of public restrooms so you can't relieve yourself or wash your face in the sink. They put padlocks on dumpsters because if you're broke, you're not even worthy to eat trash. Not worthy to eat trash. Why? Look at a padlock on a fucking dumpster and ask why. It ain't because anyone is saving that trash for something. It's because people who couldn't afford it on the shelf might take it from the trash. 
thereby filling an undeserving empty belly. It's because you need to be afraid of being denied that trash. It's because you'll work hard and quietly if a locked dumpster is the alternative. It's because power dynamics being what they are, disobedience, dissatisfaction, dissent, and disability must lead to suffering. As Marta Russell observed in Capitalism and Disability, American business retains its power over the working class through a fear of destitution that would be weakened if the safety net were to actually become safe. In the United States, that's why labor rights have stagnated. That's why safety standards are a decade behind other developed countries. That's why environmental protections are laughed off. That's why workplace accessibility is an afterthought. That's why many HR departments are organized to protect companies from sexual harassment rather than the workers. American capitalism affords you the freedom to choose between being an obedient laborer or standing up for yourself and being forced to have to pick that dumpster's padlock. This goes beyond just scaring you into being a compliant worker too. Look what the pandemic has shown us about how capitalism treats school. It's just a place workers stash their kids while they work. As COVID rips through schools this year, leaving in its wake dead teachers and disabled students, corporate controlled media went into consent manufacturing overdrive, demanding that schools continue in-person learning so that parents were available to work. When some schools ran out of healthy living teachers, they put cops in classrooms to act as wardens. No one seriously believes this is good for kids' mental health. That's not the point. The point is that the economy is harmed more by unproductive parents than it is by dead teachers and students. America's entire COVID response has only further highlighted the inherent barbarism of the American healthcare system. This is a system in which pharmaceutical companies accept federal grants and buy up medical patents for drugs like insulin then jack up prices because you need that medicine to be alive. The entire healthcare industry is built on denying you the ability to get medications or preventative care until the moment it becomes a crisis, and then inflating and obfuscating the cost of everything because they know you'll spare no expense to stay alive. You and your family have to suffer with untreated ailments and crushing medical debt because the healthcare system is built around the needs of corporate shareholders, not patients. If you're an American, that's just a sample of how our execution of capitalism screws you personally. For most Americans, it is inconceivable how much our standard of living is undergirded by the suffering of millions around the globe. For most Americans, we can walk into our closest grocery store year-round and buy pineapples, mangoes, fresh-peeled garlic, avocados, right alongside cell phones, USB drives, and music players with rechargeable batteries. And we can buy them cheap, too. How is it possible to buy an inexpensive pineapple when it grew thousands of miles away? How is it possible that garlic grown and hand-peeled on the other side of the globe is less than $3? You know how. Everything you buy with a rechargeable battery probably has cobalt in it, likely mined in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mining cobalt is back-breaking labor, yet somehow it made its way from Central Africa to Louisville, Kentucky into a device that might cost 20 bucks. How is that possible? You know how. And lest you think that our reliance on cheap labor abroad means those workers will at least receive some honor and respect from the domestic businesses that need them, we saw pharmaceutical companies fight tooth and nail to prevent their vaccine research from being shared with the global south. Bill Gates personally intervened to make sure Oxford's vaccine stayed private intellectual property instead of open source. Why? Because an open source vaccine would reduce Big Pharma's profit margins from obscene to merely massive. Capitalism demanded that poorer countries be denied life-saving medicine 
because it increases wealthy people's return on investment. And that's why we're all going to be sick and dying from COVID variants for years to come. If someone close to you is disabled or killed by Omicron, make sure to thank Bill Gates for his commitment to intellectual property rights. Our capitalist violence against the rest of the world goes even beyond exploitative labor practices and vaccine apartheid. In Sayak Valencia's book, Gore Capitalism, the title refers to the really nasty underbelly deep within the neoliberal project. She writes, Gore capitalism is a product of economic polarization, the excess of information and advertising that create and support a hyper-consumerist identity and its counterpart, the ever-shrinking numbers of people with the financial power to satisfy their consumer desires. In the era of globalization, the state can be understood more as an entity that eliminates its economic borders while reinforcing its internal borders and beefing up its surveillance systems. This proliferation of borders, surveillance, and internal controls increases the costs, the boom, and the demand for Gore's goods. Drug and human trafficking, contract killings, private security run by mafias, etc. The U.S. takes its culture to every corner of the globe through technology, mass media, networking, advertising, and consumption, and creates consumerist desires even in those places where it is difficult to satisfy those desires legally. There is a close relationship between the demands of the legal economy and the creation and flourishing of the black market. And it's not just corporate advertising's ability to stimulate desire that entices exploited people to turn to crime. Many companies pay others to do violence on their behalf. Don't forget that Nestle just narrowly recently escaped consequences for allegedly profiting from child slavery. Enbridge is allegedly paying Minnesota cops to harass and assault water protectors. Shell allegedly paid the Nigerian military to shoot protesters and Coca-Cola paid gangs to kill labor organizers. These companies don't just profit from suppressed wages and government bribery, I'm sorry, lobbying. Some of them profit by using violence to suppress those wages and intimidate reformers. So, why do I call this cryptocurrency? Because not only do I think the American economy needs suffering to buttress the value of stocks and real estate and so on, I think it also relies on the ability to hide the suffering from you. Because you're a good person, right? You don't like seeing people suffer. So our system goes to great lengths to obscure it. The unhoused are shunted as far away from public spaces as possible. Corporate crimes are covered up with NDAs and gag orders. Those who have the power and platforms that are able to expose abusive workplaces, predatory insurance executives, and the exploitation it takes to put food on your store shelves are paid to talk about something else. Anything else. Because if you knew how much blood it takes to oil American machinery, you wouldn't put up with it. So that's pretty bleak. Well, good night. Ah, uh, just kidding. Looking at the vast concentrations of wealth and political power backing this system of cruelty, it does feel easy to slide into nihilism, to want to give up. How can you or I possibly expect to stand against it and survive? Well, if this rotten system is truly fueled by suffering, then we have our answer on how to fight it. Starve the system. Reduce suffering. Right this second, you and I probably can't destroy the predatory systems preying on us. What we can do is start pooling our resources, our expertise, our time, and our energy to reduce suffering in our communities. This is called mutual aid, and it's different from mere charity. According to Professor Dean Spade, 
mutual aid values self-determination for people impacted or targeted by harmful social conditions. It gives things away without expectations. It assesses the work based on how the people facing the crisis regard the work. And it makes sure people impacted by decisions are the ones making them. This differs from charities that tend to be run top-down as quasi-businesses and tend to be motivated by donors' opinions and needs rather than the material conditions in the community. I can't tell you the best mutual aid project for your community because I don't live there and I don't know what your friends and your neighbors need. There's no one-size-fits-all solutions. You gotta ask around. Maybe it's a community fridge. Maybe it's a lending library. Maybe it's a renter's union. All I know is that every day, people can and do reduce suffering in the lives around them. And that's a powerful act. Dismantling these big systems takes lots of time and lots of people. And unfortunately, right now, a lot of people can't even conceive that a better world is possible. Mutual aid projects that address their immediate suffering can give them a glimpse of something new. And even if they never choose to act on that, the mere fact that there's hope for people outside of our predatory system makes that system just a little bit more vulnerable. Anyway, hopefully that gives you something actionable to walk away with. Why don't you get down there in the old comments and discuss or promote a local mutual aid project in your area. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this, and I'd love for you to share it around and spread the word. As always, I'm grateful for your time, and I hope to see you on the next one. Good night.